Thank you all. Uh, we've come to the fun part here. Uh, we've been done quite a work in producing the lower portion of this anvil, uh, the hardy shank, the, uh, the upper shank of the tool. Now we're going to work on the actual anvil face and the horns for it, the bix of the anvil. So this is the fun part. Um, I have one more of these floating around here somewhere. If somebody sees that or spots where it's it, that's what I thought. That is, yep, I'm looking the wrong direction. Thank you, Alan. All right, cool. Might make it easier if I have both. How are we doing temperature-wise? Main thing is we just want to keep those thin ends from getting too hot, that's sure. all. Huh? Where are the, oh yeah, she took them, huh? Where are those? Okay, thank you. All right, um, the very first thing we're gonna do here is, uh, I really like this shape, this kind of German anvil shape where it's got the wider face and it steps down for both of the horns. I really like that form. So that's what we're gonna do here. The first thing I do is a little bit of butchering in those two locations just to isolate that mass and get that line started. It's just a little bit to get in there, then we'll work the material outwards. We're gonna mark him first. Just bring him over here and set him. Uh, if you'll stand it with the edge, this edge, like so. Uh, a little more, yeah, like that. Flip him. Rotate him around, uh, like so. This is just to give me a rough idea where I'm starting from. Cool. Yeah. One more. One more. Yeah. Switch hands. And there. Hang on, let me get my thumb out of the way. All right, there. Again. All right. There. Go ahead and hit him hard, Rory. Again. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, wants to jump out of that line. Yeah. 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 It's getting cold. Let's go ahead and heat him up. Thanks. Are you doing those in line with the web? Or what was the web? 
Mm. No, I'm, I'm kind of not in line with the web necessarily. I'm leaving a little more. I'm coming over this to this side a little bit right here because I want to leave a little bit of width, a little length to that. I'm, but I'm just trying to make it somewhat even on the four sides. Um, so there's, this is about the result I'm looking for. So, okay. Not even with the web. It's not even with that. It's out further. Yeah. But I'm just trying to notch in so I'll get a nice clean shoulder there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so his question there was, am I trying to mark it and then butcher it in line in line with this web here? The answer was no. I'm just trying to create um, uh, an isolation, butcher it to create a nice shoulder here. It's out a little further. And that's just, I'm uh, picking that by taste. That's where I want it. Needn't be super hot for this. No. Nope. Because nah. what we'll do is we'll set these in, we'll clean it, get it back to the fire. Yeah. 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 Go ahead and hit them hard. A little more. That one's plenty. Okay, there. I'm not gonna go very deep here. Just not gonna tap that, just much lighter. Yeah, okay. This is a little easier to control for me. Go ahead and hit that hard. One more. Yeah, that's good. This one you're gonna have to hit pretty hard. It's getting colder. Harder. Again. Yeah, I like that. Cool. I'll clean this up and get it back to you. I'll let everyone take a peek at this real quick before it goes back into the fire. That's better. That's much better. Oh, it's a lot easier on a hand to put a ring on it. You can also fiddle with it, move it around a lot more, a lot easier without dropping everything on the floor, which I'm really good at doing. I don't need extra practice at that. All right, so we've just butchered those lines in a little ways. That's something like an eighth of an inch deep. That's as far as I wanna go with that just to set them in and then we can work away from that. That'll help us to create a nice neat shoulder when we're working on the anvil, forging this down. Carl. All right, that's the purpose of that. Uh, Rory, just heat one, one side this time around. We'll concentrate on one side. take a look at these like I said they're box jaw tongs but they were fitted while hot to fit that web right and it says you'll see the slight flare that's on the inside of that they're just they're just a simple variation you can take a pair of box jaw tongs and real quickly make them fit right but that's the point they fit snug they fit tight to the work so that it's not slipping everywhere in the tongs as you're working and it's not popping out when you're hitting it hard Yeah. Um, where exactly on there are you holding it when you're doing that? 
Do we have a moment, Rory? Sure. Sure, okay. Got all day, all right. Uh, this is kind of an example, so I'll start. The question was, if I'm doing this in the shop, working in a power hammer, and I'm upsetting the web, where am I holding it? Something like this, flat, a pair of flat jaw that bite the thin web tightly, like this, right on the hammer die. I'm holding them like so. Or better yet, if you have a pair of square tongs, um, like the ones that Rory is holding, that have a notch in them, made so that when you grab them, this way you can grab square on a diamond. Okay. That's a little better yet, if you find a pair that fits. But I'll grab it like that, and I'm working them in the power hammer like that while it comes down and hits. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't, that seemed like the only place you could. I was wondering, I wasn't sure if by holding it here if that was going to cause any kind of distortion problems. No, as long as you keep an eye on it and it's not going totally out of control, okay. no. Okay, whenever you are, sir. First, we're going to set that space in a little bit using the set hammer here. We'll start right with the whole thing on the flat of the anvil face. Go ahead, hit him hard. Again. Let me turn myself around a little. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Right. There. Okay, Rory. Uh, let's get him hot again. We'll start. We'll start forging at the end. But let me get. Let's get him hot. Uh, like I said, I'm very fond of working with a ring locked on my tongs all the time especially power hammer work, but even work at the anvil, it's going to save you in the long run. Gripping the tongs all day long is really tough. The one time that I do not like using a ring like this is when, or when I've had trouble, is when I'm quenching steel. I was putting a tongs in there, locking it with a ring and quenching steel and water. And it, as it goes through that size change, as it shrinks in dimension, as it's cooling, I have had things loosen in the tongs enough that the whole thing fell out. So that's the one time I don't use a ring on my tongs. I have a good grip on there when I'm quenching the steel. So I'm gonna hold this angled on the anvil. If you strike there on that very end, we'll hammer that point down. We'll start by bringing it down on both sides first, and then we'll work it on the square. Flipping. Focus on the very end. Yeah. Hold. Catch him like that. That's good. There you go. One more. Couple. Hold. Right there. That's good. Smooth them up a little. I'll flip. There you go. Cool. All right. Heat the same one up again. We're going to use the set hammer and work him further back. All right. So we've got a nice taper started on him. We're tapering the end mostly, leaving a mass here, which we'll work into now. Thank <laughs> you. 
This is an example I brought along of uh, doing these in the power hammer. Like I was saying, the difference in the hand forging these on the anvil, in forging them on the anvil, I'm making the hardy shank first. I want to make that first off so I can get it in the anvil and work it there. In a power hammer, you have a height problem. If you forge that shank out, you're making this taller. You get it between the hammer dies and it either won't fit in the dies or with very little room, it's going dink, 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 and nothing's happening. So when I'm working them in a power hammer, instead of forging this first, I start in the web and I upset the web first. So this is one where I've done that. I upset the web first off and then after that, I upset this first, then after that, I just simply forge that mass to a square that I can get a hold of conveniently with my tongs. Yes. Okay, go. Go. Again. Go. 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 This is pretty thick. I had forgotten it was this thick. Okay, go ahead. All right, uh, hang on. Right there. One more. Let's get them hotter. Okay. Yeah, get them good and hot back at the base of that horn. If anyone has questions anytime, feel free to ask. We'll, I'll answer them as I can. Did you find that Rory hammer online? What's that? Did you find your Rory hammer online? <laughs> Did I order him online? Hey, that's a great idea there. You, you, I'm sure you know some place you could add that in. Yeah. Uh, mail order, have them delivered. Free, what's that? Free cycle. Free cycle, yeah. Found him on Craigslist. There you are. Yeah. Let me flip him. Yeah. Yeah. And one more. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. I'm not on the shoulder very well. Something wasn't right there. All right, go ahead. Yeah. Go. One more. Ooh, that's pretty nice. A little medium, so we'll smooth this up a little. One more. Cool. All right. It's a little bit of an angle. I'm going to tip this a little. Go ahead and hit him like that. Go ahead. Yeah. That's pretty good. All right, cool. Ah, there's enough heat here. Go ahead and hammer that. Yeah. 
my human power hammer here. All right, sweet. What we'll do next, we'll refine the point down a little smaller, a little smaller yet, and then, uh, then we'll smooth everything up. Real great start. Let me show this here real quick. So we've got a real nice start for a square bick on there. Yeah, right there. We're gonna taper the end a little more and then smooth them down to it. Today, Rory is both striker and fireman. Very cool. Uh, I'm working it with the set hammer here for two reasons. One is to reach into that shoulder where we, iced, where we butchered it and try to keep from uh, hitting that shoulder and folding it over, creating cold shed or mangling it in some way. The other is just for nice and smooth. I want to taper this out in nice, smooth lines. Uh, so when I'm done, I don't even have to grind the sides. I just hammer them out nice and smooth to the taper I want. The top will get ground down and call it good. And I suppose a good part of the reason why I'm doing that is because I am so used to working on a power hammer. I like that. I like the control and the, flat, the flatness and the smoothness you get working in one. So I'm kind of replicating that here. Yeah, we'll hammer that very point end with the set hammer. Okay. All right, go ahead. One more. Like that. There. Right there. Again, let me look at it. No, it's good, that's good. Let's do another one here. Okay, really hard here, Roy. Yeah, again, that's good. Again. Go, 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 go. One there. One more. One here. Let's uh, get them warm again, just in the very end. Not super hot, just warm, and we'll smooth that down. You can see where I caught the set, ha uh, set hammer into it. I like that. This one's going to come out a little bit at one taper and then change to a different taper all at once, a steeper taper. Otherwise, it would just keep getting longer because there's a good bit of mass here. But I like that. We'll smooth up the very end and I'll call that side good. That's good. Okay. That's good. Ah, having trouble finding that lip. There it is. We're just going to smooth it so just nice and medium.
right there. I didn't have it hanging out the end again. Okay. Right here where it's flat. That looks pretty good. That looks pretty good. Let me brush this up. We'll switch to the other side. Right, Carl? So we've got a pretty smooth, nice square taper here. Comes out straight, almost straight for a little ways and then tapers away. That's a good length, so I'm gonna leave it like that. I'm gonna leave the forged sides, the bottom. I like all of that. It's pretty nice shape. The top will get ground down in the end. So I like that, it's a nice taper. It'll look good when it's all finished up. And then a little uneven, a little cup in the top, small mark where the set hammer was, that's all gonna get ground down in the end. Um, I typically use a 12 inch sanding disc. I'll start with 36 grit and I use a belt sander also and grind this nice and flat. Okay, other tongs. Thirty-six. Then I'll drop down to probably um, something like eighty, one twenty. I end at three twenty. This this has been done to three twenty random orbit on a random orbit sand, DA sander. Uh, then I did after the tempering because it was blue to bring it back. I just sanded it by hand with some three twenty again. If you want to after work tempering. after tempering, yeah, yeah. I will actually. Um, Grind it almost to a finish uh, before hardening. Belt sander. Belt, belt sander. And I do my file work because uh, typically what I do, I forge, I anneal, and then I harden. The annealing step is very important. And also, once it's annealed, that's where I do all of my dressing on everything. I grind everything flat, and I use a file, and I file the horn. And this hard, hard steel files beautifully when it's annealed. In fact, it's easy to go overboard. You can go overboard doing it with a file. So I highly recommend don't use a grinder, a sander, power equipment, and abrasives to do this step with. You'll end up regretting it somewhere. Uh, do it with a file. It's easy enough, it's fast enough, and you can go overboard really quick. Wow, how'd that happen? I was just filing it. Um, and do, you know, it's 90% of that work, and then hardening. Um, I leave it at 320 grit if it's gonna be used with steel or iron. If you're gonna do jewelry work, um, copper, silver, other non-ferrous metals, polish it. You want a mirror polish on there, because every mark, even 320 grit, is gonna show in your work. So take it to a sand, to a 320 grit, and then buff it to a nice polish. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead and just start hammering away again. Yeah. I'll flip. Right there. Go. Towards the end, on the very end. There you go. Wow, that's good. Right there. Good. A little bit more right there, just a little more. On the end, yeah. Cool. Thank you. 
We're doing the exact same thing on the other side. And we're going to create more or less the exact same form as a square and then round them up. The only difference being I want the two horns to end up the same. So at pretty soon we're going to reduce some mass here. Pretty soon we're going to chop a piece off here um, to account for the extra length. Now I go ahead and hammer some out before I do that just simply because it's easier with this stretched out there in a square. It's a little easier to cut it off than to cut it off shorter back here and hammer it down. Uh, Rory, this time around, heat up this whole area here real nice and hot. We'll work that. At the end of this next heat, will you remind me before we come back to the fire? Remind me to pull measurement with the calipers. Okay. And while that one bakes for two hours at 375 degrees, we happen to have another one right here that's for the for the cameraman to eat. The trouble with a lot of those cooking shows is they're very fond of producing something and then holding it in front of the camera and begin eating you eating it in front of you and telling you how great it is. This is so good. I wish you could try this. <laughs> no, they would say anything else. Yeah. Should be sufficient. Uh, no, but it can be soon enough. Yep. Let's do it. Oh, uh, like this to begin with. I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. You get a second bite with the tongs. It's a little slippery. Okay, go. All right, cool. That's enough there. Let's start working them down. Go. Yeah. 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 Flipper. Okay, go. Uh, let's do this on a rounded edge. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I'll let you get away with it. Let me see your tongues oh, real fast. I fail. Yeah. Five. Next. Get out of here.
All right, cool. I found a file in a garage sale a while back. I'm really fond of it. I use it quite a bit. It is Nicholson, one of their old ones, but it's called a flat shear tooth. It's really steep angle. I don't know if anyone knows about these offhand or a good place to find some. I would like to get a couple more. Cause, or Which tool? Travers. Okay. So what's the purpose of these? So you can file something while it's turning. Okay. They cut nice. They're aggressive. Travers. Does anyone know the story of what's going on with Nicholson's files? Because we... I ordered some recently and they say made in Brazil now and within a week the edges all chipped off. They're all chipped and I, granted they were kind of, they weren't treated the best but they seem really brittle. Those are good. No, sorry, I have them right here. Uh, Rory, I'm going to straighten that int horn out a little bit first right there, okay? One more. All right, cool. Back to this. Yeah. Yeah. Flip. Yeah. 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 Oh, very nice. Just two more right here. Okay. Here. Let's do it here. All right. Cool. Right there. We're actually going to cut some length off of this. Um, let's go ahead and we'll set this in here. Go ahead and smack him hard. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Can you reach in there safely? Good. One more. Same thing here. All right. We went ahead and made use of this heat to start knocking the corners off, begin to produce an octagon to the end of that. But like I was saying, because I want the length, because I want the length to come out the same on both, we're going to trim a little off here. Let's go ahead and get him hot, and I'll locate a uh, hearty. Uh, hot on the end so we can cut the end off. Let me sneak past you here real quick and I'll I'll try this. Yeah, this will work. Oh, that's plenty hot. Yeah, just let it let it soak for a second. There's a, there's the first one we did. So one one of these days I'll get to finishing it up. All right, Rory, if you'll strike for me while we do this, these again. Yeah, thank you.
yeah, go ahead. One more. Yeah. Yeah. Go. Go. A little easier because it's getting thin, but go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. One. See if that'll shear off. Go ahead. One. One. Yeah, right there. Go ahead. Good. And we'll start again just tapering that end out. In this case, I'm really specifically wanting for this horn to have a shape where it's one taper starting and then another taper coming away. This one being much less of a taper than what that is. I'm specifically looking for that in the square form before I round it up. That's what creates this nice shape right here. Start right there. Turn flip. There you go. Real steep, as steep as you can get there with the, yeah. Right on the end. Let me flip. Right there. Okay. I'll flip. Yeah. Flip. Work backwards towards me a little bit. Yeah. That's good. Here. Let me flip. Yeah. Very good. Cool. So there's what we're talking about. One slight bit of taper in the back and a steeper taper coming to the front. Square taper. I have it. Like so. Take a medium heat on this, Rory. We'll smooth it up a little bit, and then we'll reheat. Oop, losing my grip there.
just medium blows, smoothing them up. You've got to straighten it up a little bit, knock him down there. One more. Okay, now this way. Cool. Oof. All right. I'm a little bit long already. Go ahead and get it though the horn nice and hot. This next heat, I'll hammer him for a bit. One of the really great things that Craig taught me while I was working for him is take really good notes as you work. You're busy, you're moving, you gotta get something done. Stop, write down what you did. Write down how much metal, what temperature was it, what some particular thing, because in a couple months, I forget. I forget what I made the tools out of. I forget how I did something. It's really, really important, and you will appreciate taking the time to do that. Keep real good records of what you've done so you can do it again in the future. It's better than starting fresh every time. Um, the same ones I've been working with. Yep. Yeah, a little hotter. Barely warm, we must not really be working. Did we actually do anything today? It said, did we actually do anything today? It's barely warm. I have them.
part of the reason I'm working over here, if I'm hammering that portion, is this nice soft rounded edge here is wonderful. It keeps from digging in at the base. I like to try to keep a radius to that. So working it right there over that generously rounded part of the face. Uh, go ahead and get the whole thing hot again. Yeah, and if you'll strike for me this time. No, we'll keep it handy. We'll keep it handy for a minute though, just in case. I think we're gonna have to, well, extend the square horn out a little bit. After doing a few of these, it's making me wish I had a nice heavy crane in the shop and a little bigger of a forge. How big of a chunk of tool steel couldn't I get in the power hammer anyways? Bigger hammer, yeah. Yep. It's called tool lust. I think that's a disease we all share. Yeah. Why? What is it? Yeah. This is Rory and I, our practice piece. Oh, okay. Which, you know, I'm unfinished as yet, but that was with all the forging. And uh, we did that in my house out of the coal fire so that we could practice on it and get the uh, steps down, so. One that I have done? Yeah. This one right here? With an atmospheric board? Yes. Really? Yes. Um, no, let's see, and that one has an air blast on it. Two burners with a very small squirrel cage fan on it. Yeah. And a butterfly valve. Yeah. Homemade. No, it is English. It is Swan, is the brand name from England. Uh, Swan Portaforge. Uh, the competitor is the name of the model. Uh, really nice. Huge amount of insulation for this little box, a small fire chamber, but it, it, that's the one I was talking about. It has two burners and they're in the back. So the heat's, there's kind of a hot spot towards the back and the port in the back is smaller than in the front, which allows me to kind of have a hot spot, which is nice. Uh, and this is one, uh, this has been in vermiculite. Yes, this was in vermiculite, but that was done in the same forge and with the oxides. Five, four, three. That looks good. See. All right, this is going to be light, Rory. We're going to start at the back here. Actually, real quick, let me do this. At this point, where I'm getting towards finishing, I do like to clean the crud off of it before we hammer that in. Okay, right here. this heat here uh, just a little more right there let's go ahead and start rounding up while we have the heat
cool. We'll continue doing the same thing down the horn. Yes. Square octagon round, of course. Rory, turn around. Uh, show, the, show the camera. Is he your whiteboard or your blackboard? Speechless. Um, okay. Yes. And hammering around there, holding it to the sharp shoulder of the anvil, and working with the nice, I've got a slightly rounded edge to the set hammer there, working it in that. Uh, I did clip a little bit on the shoulder earlier when I was swinging the hammer. I'm going to take and figure out how to grip him and take a little bit of that off right now. I follow these shoulders back a little bit anyways. I just try to keep a nice line crisp as possible. I try hard not to fold anything. Um, try hard not to fold anything, but I do follow them later on. Okay, right there. Right here. See that? I clipped that with the hammer. I got a little fold. I don't want that fold going any further. If you start to get a fold in the work, stop and get rid of it. Take it out. Immediately. Take it out. If you can hammer it back, great. If not, a file or a grinder. You do not want it to fold over more and become a cold shut, which with further hammering simply becomes a crack. You don't want that. So just get rid of it. And I'll just take that back a little. So it is hitting that a little bit. That's not a problem. A little, no problem. I'm going to file that more later. Okay. I will actually file this whole s from oh, yeah, that's right. the half side off oh, all the way around. Yeah. I'll do a little bit of hot rasping to the horn perhaps once we've finished forging. But normally, at this point, when the forging is all done, heat it back real nice and hot. Bright, bright orange, really bright orange. Um, you know, around 1800 degrees, put in vermiculite overnight. Let it cool down. Uh, when you take it out, you can file away. A nice coarse bastard file will cut the stuff. Um, it's really easy to do, real simple. It's actually, for me, it's a pleasure filing on these things and getting them down nice. I file the round horn, file it to shape. Um, the square one, if the forging's nice on the side, all I do is grind the top. I look when the forging is done, I look to have either flat here, or if anything, maybe raised up a little in the middle so that I can then sand that top smooth. A bright, bright orange, yeah, bright yellow, orange, yeah. Like a non like past non oh, way past, way past. Get it good and hot, bury it in vermiculite. And again, if, if you don't have vermiculite, bury it in something so it can anneal. Okay. Yeah. Let it cool down nice and slow. You know, it's going to take all night long plus some of tomorrow to cool down. All right. Yeah, we're smoothing them up, so. It'll be plenty. I'm going to brush it before you start hitting, okay? Nice and easy, Rory. Start there. Okay, I'm gonna move backwards here a little bit, lightly. Whoop, sorry. sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, now tap them. Just tap. Yeah, faster. Tap, 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 tap. Okay, hold on. Same thing here. Tap, tap, tap. All right. A little more. That's good. I let the I let the set hammer dig into them a little bit there. I can file that end in the end. That's a pretty fine point. Hit that. Go ahead and hit that pretty hard. Right there. Yeah. Softer. It's not bad. Cool. I got a little marks from the set hammer in there, but I can file that in in the end. But it's a pretty nice rounded horn now. That side's the same length as the other side? It's slightly longer. It came out slightly longer. So I'm just going to stretch the other side now. Um, and so you can see that shape there. So that's roughly the evolution of that. Square taper, being much tape, more taper, steeper taper at the end. When they round it up, that's giving it this nice belly here. All right. Let's get the other side now. Let me look at one thing real quick. Yeah. take a peek at them real quick all right yeah just a little more heat right here to the end and we'll call it good I'll brush it again when we come out of the fire Slippery. Medium. Again. Let's go a little more. flip them over this way. I'd feel comfortable about it. Go. Yeah. Yeah. 
Ja. Ja. Mooi. Straighten them up a little there. One more like so. Oh, that overdid it. Let's take a little back. Again. All right. Almost there. Let's just smooth the tip end up. Then we're working on the shank end. Pull the taper. I am. That's me. Slightly OCD. And uh, I'm very fond of things real smooth, clean lines, looking for the balance. Um, it's not necessary. I would say, if anything, for, if anything affects the working properties of it, weight balance is probably, and leverage is probably more important. But I'm going for aesthetics here and how it looks. I want it to be functional and look really cool. Um, I'm a big proponent of that. Really cool looking tools, nice looking tools. A place, a, a workshop, a workspace that you're just happy to be in, very comfortable in. Um, even down to uh, if the ends of things around you are cut, rounding them off, making them nice and soft. I don't want things cutting me as I'm walking around and using my tools, I want to be comfortable. You know, just making a very pleasant workspace to be in. And to me, that comes down to the tools. I'm kind of a fanatic about that. Send them to the office to Nichol Nicholson? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Where they were? Yeah. Well, this, we ordered this one uh, via McMaster a couple, two or three years ago. But it was the first one I'd ever seen. It says Made in Brazil stamped on it. And who knows, maybe they've worked it out since then. but. I would certainly hope that a company like Nicholson would. Soft. Make sure I'm not missing the steel. I'm hanging over it so you can't see it on that side. One more. Yeah? Okay. I'm going to tip this so we can kind of bend it a little in the back. Go. There. There. Again, hit them hard right there. Okay. Now, we're going to come back. Not quite as hard. We'll come back a little. I'm just letting it flex on me. Okay, get right there. I'll call that good. Once that's ground down, it'll be good. If anything, I like leaving, rather than making like a purely square form here, if anything, I try to leave it, this is pretty square, but it's okay to leave it a little tall in this dimension, because you're grinding down. You're removing material off the top. Same thing with the horn. You can leave it a little oval in the vertical form, so that you grind a nice area on the top at the end. Not yet, excepting one young woman who is only starting in jewelry as a, you know, an interest. And so she saw what I was making and was like, I worked with her. She's like, I would love to have something like that. So as a, you know, uh, when she left the company, I made it as a present for her, you know, and uh, with a slight difference. Um, 
But no, I, that's what I'm wanting to do. I'd like to go and talk with jewelers and say, what works for you? What are you interested in type of thing, you know? And I want to play with silver and copper myself. I'm interested in jewelry. So that was the original reason I made the very first one, not this one, but the very first one was so I'd have something to play around with, with jewelry on there. And I polished the face, mirror reflection, and I showed it to one of my good friends and he says, um, he is from Bulgaria, he's an artist from Bulgaria, and he's, oh, James, you are too much, you're over the top, man. And uh, too much. But um, hopefully someday I'll actually get to play with some silver on it. That's what I want to do. Uh, yeah, the other one, the one I'm talking about that I made um, for this lady interested in uh, silversmithing, I didn't start with a chunk of railroad rail. I just started with a rectangular bar of 4140. And so that it's a little wider in here and the bar comes down. I, I took the rectangular bar, imagine I'm running this way, isolated down out here, isolated down, forged the horns. So it kind of has a real chunky base. I then drilled and tapped underneath for two half 13 bolts. Really scared myself, quenching that 4140 already tapped, but I figured that's the only way I could do it. It worked. Then I made a big, thick, heavy, uh, uh, mild steel base to go under it, and a matching one to go underneath so it can be bolted onto a wood bench. It's got a, it rests bed solidly on a really wide steel base. So that, uh, you know, it's the same shape on top, but just bench mount. Let me grab him. Whoop. I don't have a hold of him. Oh, my bad. Let me turn it the correct way. All right, so there's a nice example. I hit that and folded the edge over. If I keep working it, that will be a cold shot. I'm getting rid of it now. Also, I turned that the wrong direction. I should be working only 90 degrees, and I did turn it in the wrong direction in Rory, and I didn't have control of it. Okay. Go. What's that? Yeah, different pair of tongs. The other ones will not fit now. And this is, this is the other pair I had that, it's got a pretty good bite. What I happen to have had for it. Sounds like the start of a new t-shirt. Yeah. This is like, for years, Jilly kept saying, what's that weird bruise on the side of your leg right there? So you always have one. I, I don't know. I don't know what that is. It's nice having some headroom strike. Yeah, yeah. Um, Rory came to my house and we set the coal forge up on my side yard, but because of the sun, we sent a, a little craft tent, 10 by 10 tent overhead and with the canopy. So he's got kind of a limited room in which he can raise the hammer swing because of the bridging of the tent overhead. Let me have him.
Let's just do a little straightening up, Roy. Just heat them in this area in general. Peter begins at 2.30. Am I mistaken? I'm trying to recall. 2.45. I grew... Oh, 3 o'clock is when... Oh, okay. All right. I grew 15 minutes. Yeah, you started 15 minutes early. Ah. That's I like to I can't remember anything five minutes. I wish I could, but it... What's that? There's that breeze. Yeah. Like I said, I like filing these and I file from about halfway around usually, file the top half, and leave the bottom because it shows the honesty of it. It shows the work you've done and where it came from. You know, that's nice. You can still see the forged surfaces to it. And, and the way the metal stretches and moves in different weird ways as you're forging create the character that's really fun about it. Everything's not perfectly square. It's not perfectly flat. It's forged. It's handmade, and it's real nice that way. Um, I love clean work. I like making things real smooth, real clean, but a little bit of, you know, the characters shows the handmade side of it. Yeah, whack him. All right. That was a lot. Okay. All right, medium. We're just going to flatten that. There. We're going to move that down a little. Again. That's nice. Sweet. Okay. One time hard, Roy. to see that way. I'm going to grab them differently so I can take a look at them. All right, tap on them right there. Let me turn this way. Just tap on them there. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Pretty close. The top's not perfectly flat, but I leave that alone for grinding. Grind them flat. Get the soot off of it here.
Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Cool. These are just fun to me. Tool making in general is fun. I can, it's like land of happy, making tools. I enjoy it. And it's a great thing that you can make something that is so useful to yourself as you're working. Ah, something's not right. I need this thing. Stop, make a tool, get on with what you're doing. And that's one of the really enjoyable parts of this craft. So these are fun. Um, got a few minutes yet. I'd just go over again. I know I've been talking about it, but go over again. Uh, from this point forward, it's time to anneal it. You want to do that prior to the heat treat. Uh, heat them up around 17, 1800 degrees, anneal it. Um, next day, do your grinding, flat grind on top. You want to get rid of some of this metal on top anyways. Get down into fresh material there where you're less likely to have lost carbon, lost other elements in there due to the fire. Uh, get below that surface. Do all of your cold filing at this point in time. Um, while it's annealed, file the horn up really nice. File the shoulders in if you wish to do that. Let's see, I'll grab them here, Get a little easier. The toughest part is filing it nice and round. And I just eyeball this, the best way. Eyeball it. We're pretty round, kind of a high spot to it here. Um, Main thing, like I said, is not to get carried away. I start with cutting in along the shoulder here. Cut the shoulder in. It's all right to leave it a little high in the middle because your belt center is gonna cut you down right there. Uh, again, work, forward, work going forward. If you've got any serious ridges to cut, and then cutting in the side and the shoulders, I'll work flat, I'll work smooth and level like this. When it gets a little closer to finished, I'll pitch the file as I'm filing it. It'll leave a nice round smooth surface there. Even like this, it cuts nice. It's really free cutting. Cut it off in facets to start with. file cuts wonderfully on the flats. It's a little tougher cutting in on the edge, but that's what I'm going to try and do here. edge of the file and work into that shoulder because even though we did a fairly nice job with the shoulders I still like to file it in a little bit here and right down to the base of the horn Make nice and round. This is great for working the ridges off, holding the file in a plane, going forward and cutting in a plane. But then for finishing, rock it. Rock it nice and smooth. Dan helped me with that last time around I was doing this. 
I like doing it at the base first and getting that right and coming out here. You can file too much off fast. This is a very fine small point. I don't usually take them down quite that far, but it's all right. Are there any other questions concerning the heat treatment of this and how the finish work at the end? Yeah, so you can continue with that process description? Yes. You got to anneal it and then... Anne how, how far do you take it before you heat treat? How far do I take? How far do you take the, the, the sanding? The sanding? Like you file the horn and then you're sanding it flat to... Yes. I, fi I file the horn until I'm happy with it. The only thing I might do is leave it slightly tall on the very top because when I come back with the belt sander grinder later, it's gonna, I want a flat surface, so it's going to grind the top a little, right? Unless you want a little flat in your horn, which is all right. That's all right. Um, I grind the top down until all of the scale is gone. It's all nice and smooth. There's also a funny... Something funny in this, you can see it in these two pieces, uh, hand it around. I think this is in the rolling. I don't think this is a crack. It's on every piece of this track that I've gotten so far. There is a mark dead across the middle of the face. I think it's something in the rolling of the rails in the mill. When they rolled the rails in the steel mill, something there. So what I did is with this one is I had to grind below that. Until Didn't, that was gone. Until it was gone. Ground until that was gone. Okay. I hadn't seen that previously in the other ones I was making. Yes, you might as well. Yeah, a real rough, a very coarse grit, very aggressive. So if you want to use a ceramic uh, alumina oxide or zirconia, that's cool. If you want to just use a regular aluminum oxide, but a very coarse grit, brand new. Brand new. Yeah, once it's, if it's been on there for a month and it's worn down, it still looks rough, but it's worn down, you're going to waste your time. The thing's going to get hot. You're getting nowhere. You're sticking, you're, you're going on uh, a disc sander or are you working a belt? That's a 12 inch disc sander is where I start um, simply because I've got the 36 grit discs. Then I'm switching to about, I think it's an 80 grit belt after that. So I want to go from 36 to something intermediate. And then pretty soon I go with a random orbit at 120. And then I do random orbit grits down to 320. You, can, you don't have to do a random orbit until the very end, I would recommend, but just keep dropping through the grits and get rid of all your previous stretch marks if you want a nice smooth surface. Right. Right. I am doing, no, I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm taking. 36 grit, 36 grit and filing. But I'm doing like 90% of the finish work prior to heat treatment. And then ideally you're taking a very small amount of time to get it up to temperature and quench it, temper it. And then you can do your finish work, your final sanding. You have very little, you know, once it's hardened right now, you know, when it's annealed, uh, the abrasive is way more effective. You can remove material faster. When it's hardened, you'll feel it even with the abrasive. It's much more work. One second. Let me just work this in real quick. Say again. Uh, you're kind of wasting your time because you're, you're bringing it back up to temperature. You're scaling it again. Yeah, you're rescaling the surface, so you're going to have to sand again. You know, I don't do foil wrapping in controlled atmosphere. You know, I have a little ceramic kiln heat treat oven that I use a lot. I love it. Um, but I'm doing my heat treating pretty much out of a gas forge.
And this is hardened. It's amazing that, you know, this file would never touch it. A mill file won't hardly do anything to it. But right now, this file eats it. Abrasives, you're, you don't have the control with the abrasives on this. You're going to regret it. All right. I can do more, but there isn't any point right now. That's the idea. I'm not perfectly circular. I'm not going to try for it right at the moment. You know, and you can especially see that on a point end. But that's the idea. File work it until it's the surface you want it to be, the shape you want. And that's the idea. All right. So, thank you. Thank you. So we've done our filing. We've ground our surface down below our imperfections, down into good fresh steel. Uh, it has been annealed to stress relieve all of that work we've done to it. Uh, it's time to reheat it for quenching. I like to start all over again, really slowly heating it. Again, I've got an electric kiln. I chuck them in there, set it for 500 degrees or a little better, walk away for an hour, come back, it's blue. I can chuck it in the forge. Um, you can simply light, if you have a gas forge, coal forge, either one, gas forge, light it, let it soak and get nice and hot to about a red, and shut it off at a dull red, not too hot. Chuck them in there, walk away for 15 minutes, come back. It'll heat slower that way. It's heating, but it's heating slower. It'll slowly heat until it's above 500 degrees, 700 degrees. Turn your gas back on. Uh, with this, like I said, I'm heating, I heat the whole thing irregular. Let it get hot in certain places, dull in others, and I get my magnet out and I'm checking it and I'm checking it. And then when I see that point that this is non-magnetic at that color and this is still magnetic at this color, I see where that is. Uh, low light is really good. That helps a lot. Pay close attention to what that color is. Soak it in a heat like that for some time to allow the chance for the mass to come up to temperature. Like I said, very difficult to control getting the whole thing even across. But the one technique of the sliding the pipe, pieces of pipe on the horns works really well. So you can heat this mass while those are semi-insulated. you got a gas forge, you just, can you just keep the, the, the hardy hole in and the, all that outside of it? Out. That's you pointing out. Right, so I, that I want to heat. I want to heat most all down through, all of the across the face and down through this mass, most all of the way down. It doesn't have to heat down in here, but I want to get at least a good consistent heat through the horns and at least most of the way down through this before I quench it. Not into the shank though, I don't bother with that. It's plenty strong as it is. So I get that all up to a nice consistent temperature all the way across at the point where the magnet didn't stick anymore, plus maybe just a hair more, just a little more. Um, I quench in oil again. Um, I'm currently using ATF um, because I don't have quench oil. I'm using brand new, it's not used stuff, brand new ATF. I have it in a metal bucket and I preheat it to 180 degrees. Uh, because I've heard that's the proper viscosity for that oil. Um, you've got it at temperature. You move swiftly, but I come over to my oil and it's ease into the oil. You don't want to shove them in there. It's oil all over you. You're splashing oil everywhere. Ease it in. But once you're below the surface, you want to move it straight up and down in that oil as rapidly as you can. You are really moving that stuff. You're really moving it to allow good contact with the oil and keep it moving straight up and down until you know all the visible color is gone. Allow it to keep cooling in there. After bed, I'll start moving around, switching it to figure eight or something similar when I know it's cooled. Cooled well below a critical temperature, but still dropping in temperature. And I don't take it out until, if, it, if you get it near the surface and you see any little bubbles or fizzing of any kind, too hot. I'll bring it up and when I can't see even heat, see the heat moving the oil in a royal, no bubbles, but just moving the oil, if I can see that happening, I keep it in oil. When I can't see that happening any longer, I take it out. I keep it a bucket of very fine sawdust handy. I chuck them in there. Sawdust helps me clean the oil off. Uh, so you've quenched it. You've quenched it. 
Like I said, I keep a very smooth, uh, 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 half-worn mill smooth file. And I test the edge. And if, it, if it's like this and you're eating the metal off, it didn't harden. Um, if it's on there again and you can bite a little, but it's very resistant, it doesn't want to, but the file bites a little, you're pretty tough. That may be acceptable right there as it is. Um, this last one, the mill file slid off of it. It knocked the scale off, it didn't do anything else. It just slid. Um, and then I threw it in my oven and I heated it to temper. I heated it 550 degrees. I let it sit for about, it sat in there for well over an hour as it came up to that and then it soaked at the 550 for a little while. It was a nice blue across the whole thing where I polished it. I just took it over to the belt sander, and I, when I was quenched, I hit it on that belt sander again just to shine the whole top. Just to give that top to silver, not just, to yeah, just, yeah, just enough so that I can see that color. But like I said, I was doing it in a kiln, and I knew what was happening anyways, but I wanted to see it all the same. Um, okay, it's tempered, 550 degrees. Let them cool down. It's rough ground. Um, start with something. You started with you know, something that's softer than your coarse grit. 36, jump to like 80 grit, something like that. Get rid of your 36 marks, 120 grit. Get rid of your 80 grit marks. Um, once you get below about 120, 150 grit, I usually switch to a DA sander, random orbit sander. Um, but you can use a belt sander, you can use whatever. Just keep going through finer and finer grits. Uh, I sand to 320 grit for steel. If you want to do non-ferrous stuff, polish it. You'd sand it to the 320. You take it to your buffing wheel. I typically use uh, emery, the black polishing compound first. I use emery and I buff it until it's pretty nice and shiny. I don't see any swirl marks, sanding marks left. Um, and then I switch over to chrome, white, the white compound. So I go emery and then chrome. And the chrome gives you, you're going to see a reflection in there. It's a mirror. The only other thing I forgot to mention is these sharp edges here, and on an anvil, I consider those dangerous. It's a hardened tool, that sharpened edge. If anyone's familiar with flint napping, I believe that the technical term is a platform. I think when you are chipping flint, you create an edge that is suitable for striking and knocking it off. This is an edge suitable for striking and knocking it off. So I say get rid of, get rid of your sharp edges. Just round them ever so slightly. I consider that sharp edge to be, you know, on a small little thing like this, you might have a purpose where you keep that. You need that for something. On a regular anvil, I say make a tool that drops in the hardy hole that has your sharp edge. Round everything up the way you want it. And enjoy. Thank you. Thank you all.